This is Brian Schwartz from University of California, San Francisco. I'm going to give you your third uh, in a five-part uh, lecture series on protozoal infections. This one is going to be focusing on tissue protozoa, specifically the tissue protozoa that causes disease in the central nervous system. Our learning objectives for this session are to list three ways in which Toxoplasma gondii can be acquired in humans, two, describe the common clinical diseases caused by Toxoplasma gondii infection in patients with HIV AIDS, neonates, and normal hosts, three, understand the key epidemiological features and clinical manifestations of Trypanosoma bruzii infection, which is the organism that causes African trypanosomiasis, Four, know that free-living amoeba can cause central nervous system infections in immunocompetent and immunocompromised hosts. So you guys have seen this in other lectures. This is our map of major human pathogens, and I think that you know that we are focusing on protozoa. So let's take a little bit of a uh, closer look. So the protozoal infections that we're going to be focusing on for this lecture and the next are those that cause tissue invasive infection. We're going to be talking about trypanosoma infections, which there are two. There's trypanosoma bruzii infection, which causes African trypanosomiasis, and I'm going to talk about that today. Um, there's also uh, trypanosoma cruzii infection, which causes Chagas disease that will be discussed in another lecture. Leishmania, uh, which causes both visceral and cutaneous disease, which will be spoken about in another lecture. And then I'm going to all discuss now uh, an overview of toxoplasma infection. So toxoplasmosis uh, is a protozoal infection that is acquired by several different routes. Most commonly, it occurs via ingestion of infected or contaminated water, and this contaminated food or water has usually oocysts uh, from cat feces, uh, be contaminated from cat feces that were in the soil, or ingesting raw or undercooked meat uh, that had uh, toxoplasmosis cysts already inside it. You can rarely get it from blood transfusions or organ transplantation, and another important way is transplacentally. It's an important cause of congenital infection. One thing to remember is that tissue cysts of toxoplasmosis can remain latent uh, for prolonged periods of time, and an individual is infected without any clinical manifestations who then has uh, treatment that in, involves immunosuppression, like somebody who gets a bone marrow transplant, or somebody who acquires an infection like HIV and develops AIDS and then is immunosuppressed may have reactivation of latent disease. Clinically, uh, let's talk about some of the manifestations. Well, normal hosts to get infected most often have absolutely no signs and symptoms of infection. However, if they are going to have clinical evidence of disease, usually it is uh, fever and diffuse lymph node swelling or lymphadenopathy. I actually had a patient recently in my infectious diseases practice who returned from a prolonged trip to Italy. There he was eating a lot of undercooked meats and in fact came in with fever and diffuse lymphadenopathy and we were diagnosed him with acute toxoplasmosis of infection. Normal hosts can also develop ocular infection, chorioretinitis, something you want to think about. Uh, and patients with uh, that disease. Uh, congenital infection, uh, as I mentioned before, this is an important cause of congenital infection, and patients can, pre uh, can present with hydrocephalus uh, because it does have a predilection to the central nervous system, uh, and you can see this patient uh, clearly has hydrocephalus, has an enlarged um, uh, brain uh, here. You can also have intracranial calcifications in neonates and chorioretinitis. In my practice, probably what I see most commonly is immunocompromised patients, predominantly those with HIV AIDS, who present with central nervous system toxoplasmosis infection. Uh, they present usually with seizure, focal neurologic changes, they may have headache, and they'll get a CAT scan of the brain or MRI, and you can see these ring-enhancing uh, lesions suggestive of central nervous system infection with surrounding inflammation. Patients can also have disseminated infection to other parts of their body. However, uh, CNS manifestations are by far the most common in this uh, immunocompromised population. The way that we make a diagnosis, um, 
in the gold standard or the way to most definitively make the diagnosis is to do a bi biopsy of infected tissue. Um, but as I imagine many of you understand that biopsying the brain uh, carries quite a bit of risks associated with it and is not usually our first choice. Um, in this image here, you can see this is a patient who underwent a brain biopsy, and you can see that there is a cyst identified in the brain that would confirm the diagnosis. Most commonly what we do in these patients is we'll do serological testing. If we think somebody had acute infection, like the one that I had mentioned before, who is a normal host who came in with fever and lymphadenopathy, we'll get some serologies, an IgM and IgG. My patient had a positive IgM, a negative IgG, suggesting acute infection. Uh, patients who you're worried about reactivation, like a patient with HIV, you may look to see if they had a positive IgG and the uh, clinical disease consistent with it. If somebody who came in with brain lesions and a negative IgG, it may suggest that those brain lesions are not due to toxoplasmosis infection. In terms of treatment, pyrimethamine plus sulfadiazine are the standard of care. Um, these two drugs, as you can see uh, here in this image, um, are both inhibitors of the uh, thymidine uh, pathway, which ultimately inhibits DNA synthesis. Uh, these drugs are also um, inhibit the same enzymes as trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, uh, which are drugs that we've talked that we will be talking about in other lectures, and they're commonly used for bacterial, uh, protozoal, or even uh, fungal infections. Um, prevention of toxoplasmosis infection for patients with HIV who have a low CD4 count, less than 100, uh, suggesting very immunocompromised state, and they have evidence of prior infection, like having evidence of a positive IgG, they'll actually be put on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole uh, for prophylaxis to prevent infection. We do recommend immunocompromised patients and pregnant women to avoid exposure to cats and eating raw meat because those are two uh, possible ways to get primary infection. Now moving on to talking about African trypanosomiasis. So we talked about malaria, which is acquired by mosquitoes, and we talked about babesiosis that's acquired by ticks, but African trypanosomiasis or trypanosoma bruzii infection is actually acquired by a uh, bite of the CT fly. Uh, there are two subspecies, Trypanosoma brucei gambiensi, which is in West Africa, Trypanosoma brucei rodentiae, which is in East Africa. Uh, and following the bite of a fly, uh, patients will go on to develop a chancre or an, a painful uh, ulcer uh, at the site of inoculation. And you can see here in this image, uh, the patient has a ulcer with a surrounding area of redness and swelling, and you can even see some tracking down to the armpit because these will drain to the lymph node. And somebody who had uh, bitten in an area that would drain to the neck, you can see in the next image that this patient had uh, lymphadenopathy uh, and swelling of a lymph node in the neck, and that's classically referred to as winter bottom sign um, in the setting of swollen lymph node uh, after acute African trypanosomiasis. Now, what African trypanosomiasis is also known as, and is important to recognize, is African sleeping sickness, because actually the later stages of this disease are go on to develop infection of the central nervous system, patients go on to develop encephalitis, encephalopathy, and um, will ultimately die of the uh, central nervous system manifestations of this. Patients present with increased sleepiness, confusion, um, psychiatric type symptoms sometimes, and it can be a very severe disease. How do you make a diagnosis of this infection? So we make this diagnosis usually by direct identification of organisms on a blood smear. And here you can see that there are a number of uh, trypomastigotes uh, in the blood of a patient who had African trypanosomiasis. These also can be identified in the cerebral spinal fluid if they uh, have made it to that stage. The treatments for this, I'm not going to go into detail. They're mostly not FDA-approved medications, and they have to be obtained by special approval from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And so it's not really worth going into that in more detail. But just to say that they tend to be very toxic medications. The last protozoa that can cause infection in uh, the central nervous system that I'm going to mention are one of the free-living amoeba, which is Nigleria phalari. You may have heard about this in the news at some point, but this is uh, a protozoa that lives in fresh water and can 
penetrate through the cribriform plate and cause meningoencephalitis, so uh, headache, fever, stiff neck, uh, etc. This is actually almost a universally fatal infection, very hard to treat. Uh, diagnosis is usually made on wet mount of cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, PCR occasionally can be used or, at, unfortunately, at autopsy. And you can see in the image here the evidence of a trophozoite of Nigleria phalari in the cerebral spinal fluid. There are several other free-living amoeba that can cause infection. Uh, I, they tend to happen more in immunocompromised hosts and tend to cause an encephalitis, uh, but I'm not going to go into that in more detail. Um, so I'm going to end here with this section, um, and there will be uh, the next module on additional uh, tissue-invasive protozoa.